Hi, um, I'm Laura Leff. I'm a professor at the School of Journalism. And I'm delighted to welcome you here today for the first Karen Fisher Memorial Lecture that's going to be delivered by Kevin Spites. Um, and when we think first thinking about how best to remember Karen Fisher, who is a Northeastern University graduate who was killed while reporting in Afghanistan, as you can see from that, um, we knew we wanted to host a, a lecture series. And we knew we wanted the lecture to be delivered by a distinguished journalist who specialized in conflict. And we also wanted someone who embodied Karen's commitment to independent reporting. And we couldn't have found anyone better than Kevin Seitz. And for that, I have to thank my colleague, Bill Kurtz. Um, Bill suggested Kevin, he pursued Kevin, he landed Kevin, and along with and another Rose. colleague, um, Gladys <laughs> McKee. What was that you said? Grove. 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 And Grove is most important because this is Boston. That was probably the most dangerous part of this whole thing. Um, and he planned this event. And I think the most amazing thing is that Bill has been a champion of this lecture series from the very beginning, from the sad day in 2006 when we learned uh, of Karen's death. And I don't even think you had Karen in class. Is that, is that right? So I think this is really a tribute to his dedication to the School of Journalism. Um, Steve Bergard will introduce Kevin Seitz and tell you about his remarkable career. So what I'd like to do now is just tell you a little bit about Karen. Um, Karen was my student and research assistant. She received her master's degree in 2000 and one. Um, and any of us on the faculty who had her as a student, and that means Alan Schroeder and Nick Daniloff and James Ross and Chuck Fountain, um, will tell you that she was among the very best students that we had ever had. Uh, when she was got her master's degree, Karen returned to her native Germany, where she began her career as a broadcast journalist, working primarily for Deutsche Welle, the German government-owned broadcast company. Uh, she covered the elections in Afghanistan and the war in Lebanon. And in October 2006, while she was working on a UN documentary on children in Afghanistan, she and a fellow journalist and her life partner um, were murdered while camping in tents at, in northern Afghanistan. Uh, when someone dies so young and so tragically, there's a tendency to exaggerate their good qualities and accomplishments. That's not possible to do with Karen. Um, I'd like to read you, to sort of illustrate that, I'm going to read you a recommendation that I actually wrote for her in 2001, not the whole thing, don't panic. Um, but I think what it does is it shows that even then, she was this remarkable, gifted, and as you can see, beautiful young woman. Um, so I wrote at the time when she asked me for recommendation. I had been teaching at Northeastern for over five years, now it's been almost 14. Uh, I've had more than 100 graduate students. Karen Fisher is among the top three students I have ever taught. Uh, before, before joining the Northeastern faculty, I was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal and the Miami Herald, and an editor at the American Lawyer and the Hartford Current. I also can say that I, had I had the opportunity to hire Karen at any of the publications where I worked, I would have done so enthusiastically. The reason is simple. Karen has all the characteristics of a first-rate journalist. She is exceptionally smart and extremely hardworking, a diligent researcher and a facile writer. Even more important, Karen has that intangible quality that for me, as an editor, was the single most important factor in hiring a reporter. She is determined to seek the truth, undeterred by conventional wisdom, deliberate spin, or the prospect of hard work. And of course, I went on like that. And the hard thing about reading that is that uh, it's all in the present tense, and now it all needs to be in the past tense. Um, once she received her degree, we corresponded sporadically, and I followed her career from a distance. We are lucky and honored to have with us today uh, Karen's editor at Deutsche Welle, Hans Jürgen Meyer, who did more than follow her career, he helped shape it. Um, the only good thing to come out of this horrible episode for me is the people that I have met as, as a result of it. When I was in Berlin two summers ago, I had a chance to meet Karen's parents, who were as, as wonderful as I assumed they would be, and I've had an ongoing correspondence with Hans. Um, and what struck me in thinking about how to introduce Hans is 
the qualities that he shares with Karen. Um, he's as brilliant as she was and has the PhD and the book on Japan to prove it. Um, one of his last acts at Deutsche Welle before his very active retirement was a terrific interview he did with the Dalai Lama, which you can all read posted on the web. Um, he is as committed to journalistic integrity, even working in a huge media corporation that, like m most media corporations, doesn't always value that. And most of, important of all, he shares Karen's essential goodness. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Hans Jürgen Meyer, who will talk a little bit about Karen and her, her career. Thank you. Well, I would have liked to talk in German because I never studied in the U.S. or in Britain. Or after my English uh, to a certain degree stems from three years in Japan, which is uh, now 30 years back. So please excuse me if my English is not correct or a little bit funny. I would do my best. And uh, I'm very glad uh, that I got this uh, invitation. Um, I would, I, um, looking forward to taking part in this discussion organized by the School of Journalism. Everyone who is, uh, uh, has done his best to organize it, especially Professor Lev. Thank you very much once again. And uh, of course, it's a, it is a very tragic event that has led us together, but let me, let me nevertheless say that I'm glad today. Glad because the those of you who have proposed this Karen Fisher Memorial Lecture, they have succeeded. It was not quite easy to organize this and to raise funds for this event, but uh, what we have done is a very good thing to say. And um, I'm saying this uh, for Karen's, uh, Karen's too. A few weeks ago, I talked to Karen Fisher's parents. They regret that they can not take part in this event because of the private obligations, but they said, that they very much appreciate this lecture, not because it is uh, commemorating Karen, but because of its aim, this aim, to analyze um, why journalists, like you for instance, may venture out into the field of danger, and if there are ways to minimize the, these dangers. And this, Marianne and Gerhard Fischer say, is something that one or two would have uh, appreciated, who never wanted to have the spotlight center of my person. And I think that this is the view of my of Karen's many friends and colleagues uh, on radio and TV Gotchamelli. They are sharing this view that here at the School of Journalism, Karen's former teachers and the new students of journalism experience reporters like today, Kevin Seitz, that they are discussing how you can venture into the hot zone in order to find out what's really going on in and beyond the battle in the field, and the battle lines without risking your personal life. Well, let me say a few words about Karen. Who was she? What were her values uh, as an aspiring journalist? Uh, she was at the age of 30, still young, very charming, frank, and totally reliable. Lord has said uh, some, uh, some uh, quite a, uh, has uh, just uh, told us something about her traits, her qualities. And uh, she was liked very much, as you can assume, uh, when she joined, uh, joined the German program at Radio Deutsche Welle. She was liked there uh, very much like here in Boston. And she immediately gained friends, won respect because of her professional abilities. She was very well uh, versed uh, technically, be it radio or TV. And uh, I think the main aspect is that she did not confine to re just reporting uh, events, but wanted to organize them in depth. Central to her was to inform the listeners not only about uh, what was going on, but that about the core of the problems, the core of conflicts. Uh, her intention was to unveil, to unveil vested interests, in, uh, interests uh, to analyze the social and economic effect uh, of, of the problems. Um, and I think this is essential to journalism. That's not just to report, to go to a press conference, uh, to report what some politician has told us, but to say what is behind this, what is the background of all of this. And uh, I don't know if she had idols like uh, Bob Woodward and other items of the investigative uh, reporting, but one thing is evident, 
European body, I think the best of US and German uh, journalists. And concerning principles, I'm quite sure that she would have refused to take part in missions with strings attached. So I'm quite sure that she would not have worked in bed in embedded in, uh, sitting in the tank and looking out at uh, what's happening there like a soldier. She would never have done something like this, I don't see. And her aim was uh, to go to the countryside, to speak with people, and to engage for children's and women's rights. Karen would never have worked, I'm sure, as a press officer for enterprises or lobby groups with non-sustainable aims. And though being a freelance, she had a virtue that is not common in German, I would say she refused to obey orders, to obey orders by superiors if she saw, thought that the big shots were wrong. And saying a few personal words, I would say, uh, Karen for me was a sort of win for profit, professionally and personally. We had a vacancy at Radio George Elle concerning our radio magazine, which is called Focus on Asia. And Asia for Karen at that time when she joined us was fairly, fairly unknown territory. But within, I would say, well, a year, she acquired a considerable knowledge of this vast and complex continent. So we became close partners managing this magazine. Uh, and uh, in the end, I would say uh, this magazine for, uh, called uh, Focus on Asia, it was called, called uh, so to say, a uh, joint venture. And uh, whenever I could not make up my mind how to cope with certain problems arising daily, I could turn to her and ask her for a consult here and vice versa. This was a wonderful working relationship, I would say. And uh, in the end, I think there was a crucial sympathy between us, but finally, it was not a friendship, of it, I would say. Also, although she, uh, she was just half my age. Well, <coughs> um, so we had approximately three wonderful years, and they abruptly ended on October 7th, as well as told. Uh, when uh, up to now unknown perpetrators murdered Karen and her wife, Traveling from Mazar Sharif, where it's a German army base, to the army of Berlin, planning to talk about the restoration of the world and Buddha stages that has been destroyed by the time. And uh, well, uh, they never reached Birmingham, uh, they were killed uh, while camping. No one knows why they did not reach uh, the Birmingham uh, Valley, something that uh, something that time maybe they just uh, um, in a certain sense, I would say Karen was victim of a desire to get to know and to explore new and uh, exciting territories. Afghanistan for her was a strange and complex country, but a very fascinating country. If you like the people there, tragically, it was an extremely dangerous country. So there the story ends in spite of the meticulous planning of the last journey. And after the death, many people assume this is a special aspect of this tragic story. Many people assume that they made blunders when they were going to the countryside and that they overestimated their knowledge of Afghanistan. Maybe, I don't know. But I heard uh, from certain sources that from the start of the journey in Kabul, they were caught in a web of conspiracy. And they never know uh, who uh, has the behind this conspiracy. Well, but let me add a word of consolation. Uh, Karen, uh, she was an ease of mind at, on the eve of this disaster. I could feel that this one we had uh, this interview uh, two days before she was murdered. She was happy enjoying life with her partner Christian that there was not another day. But now you might say, well, this has been from my side, like maybe a little bit from our the description of the saint. Of course, Karen was not a saint. She was very lively, she felt a little young, energetic, dynamic, and well, uh, she uh, she liked to go to, out to bars and this. And then let me tell you one final thing. There was one day uh, when we were planning together um, our magazine, and she had to go on air at noon at twelve. But she didn't appear. I was planning this magazine at uh, 10 a.m. She uh, 
she phoned me and said, Hans, I'm so sorry, that there was a wonderful party. I went to bed at 7 a.m. and I went to rise at 8. But I didn't mean it. She said, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I will go on my air myself. We will be there in the afternoon and then take over. But she appeared at 11 a.m. and she took over and went on air. Uh, I would say <laughs> a little bit damaged, but the voice was <laughs> the voice was clear. The message, the message, the message was clear, and uh, well, <laughs> it is uh, how she was uh, very sympathetic and very tough. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hans, and uh, welcome here. Uh, welcome everybody, I'm Steve Burgard. And uh, listening to, uh, to Hans and thinking about our speaker, I, I just can't help but make the connection between the courage uh, and commitment to ideals that some of our journalists have, both those who are produced in the United States, those who come from abroad, and we really have a, a global reporting core now. And uh, you know, from uh, Laurel's remarks, uh, make us think that these great people uh, uh, come from, from our own ranks, from our own classes, from our own schools, uh, and they carry uh, a great uh, 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 assignment on behalf of the world that, uh, that we all be informed. Uh, Kevin Seitz is a freelance uh, multimedia journalist and author based in uh, Los Angeles. He's an award-winning uh, war correspondent, and he's author of the book uh, In the Hot Zone, One Man, One Year, 20 wars, and I want to pause right there and say we do have the book here today. There's uh, be somebody outside afterwards if you'd like to get a signed copy, and uh, of course we'll invite you to uh, stick around a little bit and uh, have some refreshments with us. Um, he's a pioneering backpack journalist who has covered uh, conflict and natural disaster around the globe for the last decade. He spent most of his early career producing and reporting for some major networks, ABC, NBC, and CNN. And he's a part of the internet revolution. Uh, of course, in 2005, Yahoo hired him to be its first correspondent. He spent a year traveling all the major war zones of the world, uh, reporting for his website, uh, Kevin Sites in the Hot Zone. Unique at that time for its multimedia mix of text, video, and still images. He's reported from nearly every region, including Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, South America, and Eastern Europe. Uh, in 2003, as a correspondent for CNN in Iraq, he was captured by Saddam Hussein's Fadaya militia, and one day later, his Kurdish translator negotiated his release. In 2004, as an embedded reporter for NBC, he uh, recorded a U.S. Marine shooting and killing a wounded and apparently unarmed Iraqi captive lying on the floor in a mosque in Fallujah. After that footage was released to the television network Cool, American television network censored the actual shooting, while other international media outlets broadcast the uncut version. He's received both <coughs> adulation and hate mail for taping the video. So he has many uh, journalistic honors, including a headliner award, Overseas Press Club, Edward R. Murrow, and Daniel Pearl Awards. And we're lucky to have him in the area this year. He's currently a Neiman Fellow at Harvard, where he's examining options for sustainable, independent, web-based reporting. So it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin Sykes. I know Karen Fisher, but I wish I did because she probably would have made me a better journalist and maybe even a better human being, listening to Hans and Laurel say the things that they have said about her. And I was going to read a few things that uh, other faculty and students had sent to me, but I think what was said here today probably suffices. I also hope, and I think hearing from Hans and Laurel, that she did have a sense of humor because she's going to need one for my speech today. I've given this speech in the past with my zipper down, the whole speech. Luckily, you will not be recipients of that today. I double checked. Yes. Smile, everybody. Thanks. 
expect you to tag yourself on Facebook tomorrow. <laughs> and I'll have maybe 100, 150 new Facebook friends, I hope. Today, I'm going to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects, me. And before you think this guy is steeped too deeply in his own mythology, the reason I say that is that we need to learn lessons from our own personal narrative. They have a lot to teach us, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, that being said, there's a lot I have to say about my good and bad and ugly. Virginia Woolf wrote, if you do not tell the truth about yourself, you cannot tell the truth about other people. Because I believe that, because I believe we must account for our choices, both good and bad, and the ceaseless gray in between, today I'm going to share with you the truth about me. And I can assure you, it's not always a flattering story, either personally or professionally. For instance, I'm not sure how many of you in this room can say that you've been complicit in the death of another man. I can. Like most interesting stories, there's some violence, passion, betrayal, missteps, tipping points, epiphanies, and plenty of doubt. But while my life has had and continues to have its rocky moments, it by no means qualifies as your run-of-the-mill Irish-American tragedy. In fact, if I could characterize my life in one word, it would be this one. Serendipity. It's that intersection between peripatia and deus ex machina, a place where luck explains some things but not everything, where you have to be smart enough to also accept the gifts that you didn't ask for. And this is how that story's played out for me so far. Early on in my professional future seemed clear to me. There were two paths, so yes, there were. The first led to hoop dreams, an all-star career in the NBA. It didn't quite work out, did it? The second to life as an intrepid foreign correspondent straddling camel dung in danger at the crossroads of the world's most dangerous places. But in this case, fate would intervene in the unlikely form of my ninth grade basketball coach who tried to get me to take up wrestling, even though my high school didn't have a wrestling team. Well, pro ball players were a dime a dozen anyway, so I chose the second path, the road less traveled, the more glamorous road, the one less fraught with moral ambiguity and one night stands and rich products to endorse. At age 15, I was inspired by photojournalists like W. Eugene Smith in this photograph, perhaps his most famous. It made a lasting impression on me and I begged my parents for a 35 millimeter camera. When they finally bought me one for Christmas, a manual Olympus OM-1, I quickly declared myself a photojournalist. And I went down to my hometown rag, the Geneva Free Press, in Geneva, Ohio, 60 miles east of Cleveland, along the beautiful shores of Lake Erie, population 6,000, circulation 5,000, give or take a few. At the paper, when the editor asked to see my book, I looked at him puzzled. And then he looked at me puzzled as he walked me to the door. Once I found out what a book was, I began building mine, a portfolio featuring portraits of the family dog, action shots of squirrels, an aesthetic look at fall leaves, and a study of snow, in black and white, of course. I took my book back to the Geneva Free Press, and because my timing was right, and their part-time shooter just quit, and they were desperate to have someone sit through the endless Little League baseball games, store grand openings, and garden club luncheons, they gave me the job. I'm not going to lie, I was jazzed. <laughs> there was only one small problem. Because I was only 15, I didn't have a driver's license. I thought it would be okay to say I was 16 because I was going to be 16, well, six months from now. But what's the difference? If riding my bike to my assignments was the price of being a journal, well, that was a price I would gladly pay. Here's my first press pass. Because I was shy, the camera opened doors for me, it gave me a purpose, and allowed me to talk to people I might not otherwise approach. It also gave me a byline, the ultimate affirmation that I really did exist. And with the role of microfiche, if anyone came asking, I could prove it. No one here knows what microfiche is, you're children of the digital age, except my friends in the front, right? <laughs> but in a short time, I wanted even more. I started writing for stories I started writing stories for the paper as well. I wanted bigger stories. I wanted to touch danger, <coughs> taste it, maybe even lick it. 
Soon I got my chance. You guys don't even remember the 70s, right? It was like your parents' era, or your grandparents' era. Geneva on the lake, Midwestern paradise along the beautiful banks of Lake Erie. It was a dream vacation spot for people from Pittsburgh. There was music, fireworks, and carnival, and hot dogs, and moms and dads pushing strollers, kids eating cotton candy. But underneath the surface, well, maybe actually on the surface, there was trouble. Trouble rode a Harley, and it was coming my way. <laughs> Please indulge me for a second as I read from my diary, written after this fateful encounter. And this is, by the way, all true. Excerpt from my journal. Remember, I'm 15 here. July 4th, 1979. I was down at Geneva on the Lake taking pictures for the Geneva Free Press. Well, I thought, since there were so many motorcycle gangs down there, why not get a few shots of them? I walked up to Max's bar and I saw some men wearing the insignias of the Hells Angels. So I took a shot and I heard one of them say, what the hell do you think you're doing? I was scared, but I kept calm. I'm just taking pictures for the Free Press. Don't you want to be famous? Actually, couldn't believe any of this was occurring. I was sort of stunned. Then the short guy who spoke first said, you ask somebody before you take their picture. Then I said, can I take your picture? He said, no. But I persisted, why not? Another guy said, what's the matter, you deaf? It's funny, all the hell's angels sound alike, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> then the short guy grabbed my camera and said, you want me to bust this thing? I said, I won't print the pictures, just give me the camera, it's not mine. He said, give me the film and don't expose it. Of course, before the days of digital. So I rolled up the two shots on a fresh roll of tri and reluctantly handed it to him saying, I thought you guys were cool. The short one said, we are, we just don't like to get our pictures taken. And he stuck out his hand and I reluctantly shook it, only for the sake of my camera and myself. I started walking down the street with one less roll of film and a badly bruised ego, but stirring anger. I just had my first encounter with real life in the name of photojournalism. I didn't like it a bit. The incident hampered me for the rest of my assignment. I feel anger and hate, but I don't know if it's towards myself or them or both, or maybe it's towards the cop who stood there and watched with his thumb up his ass as I was being denied my civil rights. I won't be denied them again, and I won't stop taking pictures, and I never will be made to feel inferior to any man, no matter what insignia he has on his back. Okay, I'm not sure which is worse here, my writing, my embarrassing sense of earnestness, or my attempt to co-opt the, the righteous identity of an oppressed minority circulating in the 1970s. While I felt humiliated by, humiliated by the incident even more so now, it did help me to see that being a journalist required a commitment to principles that could mean risking your own safety to uphold. It's a lesson I never forgot. Obviously a lesson Karen Fisher never forgot either. Okay, let's flash forward a little bit. Let's say the year is 1999. I've got a master's degree in journalism from Northwestern University as opposed to Northeastern University. This one's in Chicago. And this has been my career so far. I've worked as an on-camera television reporter in a small Florida market, left a year later to work as a producer in Los Angeles in both cable and broadcast, and finally, at the age of 30, made it to the national networks as a field producer, coordinating crews and correspondents to collect information and to turn it into stories. Follow me so far? I would love to say it was only because of my hard work I got a shot at the networks. But if I hadn't dated a woman whose best friend, Ricky Goldberg, just happened to be a producer at ABC News' Washington Bureau, I'm pretty sure the top brass would have never looked at my resume reel. Thanks, Ricky. But I did work hard, and in three years, I moved up and over to NBC News to work for former Pentagon correspondent Fred Francis. We were supposed to cover law and order, but because of Fred's military background, we got sent to the Middle East a lot to report on the post-Gulf War no-fly zone imposed on Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Okay, back to this moment in spring 1999, Fred and I are in northern Albania covering the refugee exodus that resulted from the war in Kosovo. I forgot to say it this time, I'm also married, kind of, since 1991 actually, but it hasn't been going so well. In fact, my wife, now ex-wife, says I was giving her a nervous breakdown. I think that means she wasn't happy. She had been an actress, 
kind of, in Los Angeles, where we met. She moved with me to Washington, D.C. in 93 when I got my job with the network. But I ended up traveling pretty much every week, and she had to fend for herself in a strange city. All of you going to journalism will face this in your relationships if you haven't already. So by the spring of 1999, I promised her the war in Kosovo would be my last gig with NBC. I called it a sabbatical. NBC News called it quitting. When it was over, we would move back to California to San Luis Obispo on the beautiful Central Coast, where I just accepted a job at Cal Poly as a broadcast lecturer for their journalism department. It was less than half the pay, and at the time, one-eighth the respect. I think that meant I wasn't happy. But we had to give it the old college try, and uh, I was wondering, where's the serendipity in this story? You see, I walked into a broadcast journalism program that was almost in as bad shape as my marriage. But the broadcast journalism program, I had a shot at fixing. When I first walked into the college, the student television station, I saw what I had traded my network career for, a couple of old super VHS cameras, and a broken down editing deck. Anybody remember VHS in this room? Just the front row. <laughs> I immediately went to the dean and I told them to give the students their money back or give me $10,000 so I could buy 10 consumer level mini DV cameras. Surprisingly, he did. Remember, this is 1999. Then I convinced Apple Computer to permanently loan us some desktop workstations loaded with iMovie software. Since I hadn't done a lot of shooting or editing uh, as a producer, I had to teach myself to do both before I could teach my students. I taught them to become one-man bands, to report, shoot, and edit alone, because that's what they would have to do for their low-budget stations they would work for out of college. Being children of the digital age, as yourselves, they picked it up quick and used this mobile journalist concept to turn their student television station from a joke into the statewide national champions. My marriage was not so fortunate. On December 1st, 2000, the wheels came off and I got divorced. In September 2001, I was on a plane. I went back to work for NBC as a freelance producer and found myself on a thumb-shaped sliver of territory in Afghanistan held by the Northern Alliance. And here I am with my Afghan husband. <laughs> <laughs> Things that you have to do for a story in Afghanistan. <laughs> Actually, I asked for my own horse after this. It was getting a little too cozy. <laughs> in one particular battle, now you laugh, huh? In one particular battle, I didn't have a correspondent or crew, but I did have a camera, and after my sabbatical at Cal Poly, I knew how to use it. Oh, wow, that was close. The Taliban fired a mortar shell that landed uh, very close to me, maybe no more than 20 feet from me. It exploded and some of the shrapnel hit a National Geographic producer that was standing right next to me. Get on this side, get on the other side. Let's get on the other side of the tank. Back there, other side, other side. Quick sidebar. Um, this particular situation created this weird dilemma. Um, what do you do you know, when you're a journalist and someone gets hurt right next to you? you know, do you help them or do you, do you finish doing what you're doing as a journalist, telling that story? Um, you've always heard, I hope, from your uh, instructors as well as maybe from your colleagues, you know, you have to be human first, you have to help. Um, in this particular situation, I know that we hadn't seen anybody get wounded in Afghanistan yet, and I felt that was a really critical part of the story, that we see weapons being fired at, but we don't see them coming back. Just one, one of those rare occasions when we captured footage of a weapon coming back and hitting someone. You saw blood, you saw a lot more blood than, uh, than what I'm showing you here. Um, but I wanted to make sure that story got told, so I tried to do both. I tied the guy up with a scarf um, because it was a shrapnel wound entered like below his, the back of his hamstrings and then came out through the front. And basically, and you know anything about physiology, if you hit a femoral artery in your leg, you'll bleed out in four minutes. So he wasn't spurting, so I don't think that he hit one, but we tied him up. But I kept the camera rolling, so we were able to get footage and, and try to do both. Um, it's not a... Uh, an easy thing to do, and, and I also took a lot of criticism from other people for trying to do both. So you do have to make your own decisions there. Um, but I felt both jobs were equally important, and I wasn't that good of friends with the National Geographic producer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. He was an okay guy. 
Because I was able to get footage like this, NBC asked me to start reporting for their cable uh, network, MSNBC, as a one-man band, just like I taught my students. After a couple of stints in Afghanistan for NBC, CNN came calling. They said they liked the rawness of my, of my reporting, and they offered me a job as a staff correspondent. They wanted me to go to Iraq, just prior to the invasion in 2003. And then they dropped me in, in the north with the Kurds and three of their most senior correspondents, Beirut Bureau Chief Brett Sadler, Cairo Bureau Chief Ben Wiedemann, and Baghdad Bureau Chief Jaina Roth. It's clear what they wanted. They wanted us to compete against each other for the best stories. But the three bureau chiefs all had full crews and satellite dishes. I had a videographer, a bodyguard, and a fixer, or what we consider a translator, an antiquated piece of technology called a video phone, which transmitted herky-jerky video images, which looked like they were originating from the space shuttle. Needless to say, I wasn't on the air much. So with the urging, and with the help of a techno-savvy friend who had a popular website called Boing Boing, I created an independent blog. I started telling my stories on the internet. And granted, I'm a CNN staffer at this point. Surprisingly to me, with Boing Boing's promotion, KevinSites.net became very popular, ratcheting up thousands of page views. But there was one problem. There's always one problem. I hadn't told my bosses. Within two weeks, they told me to shut the blog down. I was, I think, a little ahead of the curve. They were, I think, not very happy with me. You're all taking copious notes. Are you getting tested on this afterwards? Can you just listen? <laughs> or do you have to write it? It'll be better if you listen. You'll remember more. When the oil-rich city of Kirkuk fell to coalition forces, all of us raced to be there first. I tied with Wiedemann and Aroth, but after being the, but being the junior of the three, the story was theirs. I was boxed out. There was only one city left in Iraq that hadn't fallen, Saddam Hussein's hometown of Tikrit. CNN forbade me to go there, so I did what any reporter desperate for a story would do. I gathered my three-person team and we headed right for it. 15 miles outside of Kirkuk, we ran into a group of Iraqi soldiers packing up their vehicles in full retreat. We threw our vehicle in reverse, pulled back about a thousand feet away, and set up for that famous video phone live shot with its herky-jerky images. While Ben Wiedemann and Jane Araf reported from Kirkuk on yet another statue of Saddam Hussein being toppled, I had images of Iraqi soldiers behind me trying to make a getaway. Herky-jerky or not, that live shot probably saved my job for the time being. Emboldened by our success, the next day, my team and I headed further south to Tikrit. It would be in our, our undoing. Just 20 miles outside of the city, we ran into a checkpoint we thought was manned by Kurdish Peshmerga militia, allied with the Americans, but it was actually Saddam's Fedayeen militia. Six of them surrounded our vehicles, and their leader, a fat man in a dirty trench coat, red kafia, pointed his AK-47 <laughs> through my open window as my fixer, Tofiq, told him this lie, we are Al Jazeera. <laughs> if you're with Al Jazeera, the man said, nodding to the logo on the tripod case strapped to the roof rack, why does this say CNN? <laughs> we were pulled from the vehicles, and as I stood there, the Fedayeen leader fired a single round between my legs. I was too surprised to even flinch. This one, is surely an American spy, he said, as Tofiq translated to me later. We were forced face down on the pavement in execution positions with the muzzles of the rifles to the back of our heads. As others searched our cars, strangely, only I was bound with rope. They stripped, they stripped us of everything, our clothes, all of our camera gear, the $20,000 I had in cash hidden around my body, even our watches. After a while, they threw us in the back of a flatbed truck and said they would take us to Tikrit to the military's intelligence headquarters. But my fixer, Tofiq, began to outmaneuver them. He said there would be an American retribution if they didn't let us go. He said that the Americans would bomb the village back to the Stone Age if they didn't release us. 
Finally, the Fedayeen gave us over to the village chieftain. Tofik then exploited his fears as well, telling the chieftain his village would be destroyed unless we were immediately released. Finally, at dusk, the village chieftain got one of our stripped down vehicles back from the Fedayeen and told us to drive back to coalition lines. We were grateful to be free, but coming back now meant I would have to face the wrath of my CNN bosses. With the blogging, the disobeying, of, the disobeying of the directives, and the loss of all that gear and money, my fate was pretty much sealed. A few months later, back in the US, CNN fired me. I didn't waste much time calling NBC. I was back in Iraq by the fall. But as part of my freelance contract, I made NBC guarantee I could reopen my blog. They understood the value of blogging and quickly agreed. It would, I would soon find out, be the best move of my career. Flash forward two or three deployments into Iraq, and I'm embedded with the 3-1 Marines, November 2004, on the eve of the Battle of Fallujah, or as the Iraqi government called it, Al Fajr, or the Dawn. It was one of the biggest US military battles since the war in Vietnam. For a week, the fighting is intense. This is what some, some of it looked like from my camera. RPG was fired behind us, a rocket propelled grenade, hit the wall, exploded, um, and then basically it was a, a typical kind of guerrilla ambush. You had uh, insurgents with RPGs at one end uh, in the south, and you had uh, insurgents with dragging off sniper rifles coming from the north. And you have a, a huge force of Marines, you know, best equipped uh, military in the world. Um, and basically, these basic insurgent guerrilla maneuvers end up putting them down. So they decided to direct all their fire from where they thought the, uh, the shooting was coming from, this building to the north of us. And you didn't see the half of it, but um, they're firing all their M16s in there. They brought in two uh, Abrams A1 tanks to fire simultaneously. And then the confusion that you saw uh, with Sergeant here saying, we want to fire our tow missiles, but it's a wire-guided missile. But there are wires overhead, so it can short it out and create some problems. So they fired the AT-4, an anti-tank weapon, instead that came out of that uh, that tube at supersonic speed and broke up my video. So that was the breakup that you saw. So there's a lot of confusion going on. Um, and as Hans said, maybe Karen wouldn't have embedded. Um, embedding for me was about telling the soldier story. That's part of part of the conflict, not the whole conflict. You need other people in other places to do that, but that was primarily my role. But there's a lot of confusion going on, obviously. And uh, you know, it, it's good to try to understand this but at the same time, this stuff is so inherently dramatic. Everybody that was sleeping in here five minutes ago when I was talking wakes up to watch this um, because it draws us. Unfortunately, it also seduces us to covering war in a very inaccurate way. Combat is the smallest feature of any war, the smallest. Um, I'll get more into this later, but you know, this happens. Sometimes the hardest thing about war coverage is finding the combat. 
Then on Saturday, November 13th, this is the same Battle of Fallujah, I captured the most controversial footage of my career. I videotaped a Lance Corporal executing a wounded, unarmed insurgent in a Fallujah mosque. He was one of five that had already surrendered the night before, but instead of being taken as prisoners, their wounds were treated and they were left behind in the mosque. The following day, the Lance Corporal entered the mosque and finished the job, shooting them first with his M16, and then when that jammed, he pulled out a 9mm handgun and shot them. Anyone that knows anything about guns, you shoot with a handgun, you have to be fairly close, or you have to be a very good shot. But usually you're close enough to see what the person in front of you has, whether they're armed or not. Once I entered the mosque, I watched through my viewfinder as he fired one more time with his M16. And this is what I saw. This is the edited raw footage of the mosque shooting. The Marines are there! We've all played Grand Theft Auto, you've probably right, seen things right. that are more disturbing, but this is real. Hey, who's in here? This is the unit that I'm with. We're going into the mosque after these second shootings have taken place. There's been a firefight the night before, wounded insurgents left behind. They're shot again a second time by Lance Corporal. Before we get in there, this is the third time I've been shot. Nurgle, Nurgle, she's coming in here. Thanks, Yeah. You shoot him? Yeah. They have your weapons on? Have any weapons on? They didn't know. I walk in, I tell the lieutenant, these are the guys from yesterday. Why wouldn't they evacuate? Alright, we need another one. These are the wounded that they never picked up. Oh, they're shooting at the wall. guided by an ethical code as journalists to seek and report the truth. At the same time, we're exhorted to minimize the harm. In this case, I'm sinking in a sea of gray. The story had to be told, but would the video create a backlash that would cost more lives? I was thinking to myself, could the story be told honestly without the images? Because the video was so incendiary, NBC and I agreed that during my report, we would show the rifle being raised, but censor the actual footage of the shot. While it seemed the right decision at the time, we had instead botched a very important story of the war. My report confused viewers by not sharing the entire context of what had happened within that video. The way the Marine raised his rifle, fired at point blank range, pulled the trigger, then casually turned on his heels and walked away. It is not a defensive act, but a clear violation of the Geneva Convention. Now this being said, there are ways that soldiers and Marines are taught to do what is called a dead check. You're curious if someone's dead, they're going to pop up and shoot you, which has happened in these, uh, in these particular battles, and specifically in Fallujah. If you're worried that they're going to booby trap their body, it's not pleasant, but you take your bayonet, you put it at the end of your muzzle, you poke them in the groin or in the eyeball. If they're dead, probably not going to move. If they're not dead, few people can withstand that kind of pain. That's a dead check. This, at the very least, was not a tactical maneuver. Any soldier, anybody in here served? That wasn't tactical, was it? It wasn't right. Right. But, yeah. Tactical, you clear a room, and you want to make sure all your friendlies are out as well. He's, he's not, he, well, he's aware that we're in there, but doesn't clear us. He had been in there, gone out, been in there again. 
when he did the dead check with the 556. Um, tactically, you want to check these bodies out, make sure it's clear before anybody goes back in the room. Um, now, do I blame this particular Marine? I don't know what was going on in his head. And to be quite honest, I think basically he was doing what he thought was right. Because the situation happened three more times at Fallujah, where insurgents that had been captured were killed. What does that lead you to believe? It leads you, leads you to believe that the rules of engagement, the rules which govern the fighting that's going on in a particular battle, and sometimes they change depending on the battle, depending on the, the amount of civilians within a city, depending on the level of protection you want for your force, as opposed to the level of collateral damage that you're willing to uh, take in a particular battle. You create rules of engagement, a free fire zone. Everything in here, we warn these people, shoot it all. Or shoot only when fired upon, shoot defensively. Um, there are a number of different variations on rules of engagement. The problem is, as signatories to the Geneva Convention and the laws of land warfare, soldiers and Marines are taught what these laws are and how they apply. So when a free fire zone order is given, you have to think about that. Does that necessarily violate the conventions and the treaties that we're signatories to as well? In this particular case, lending a little insight, these rules of engagement in doing my interviews with other Marines in, in the aftermath were given by an unnamed lieutenant uh, from headquarters company that no one knew. So there's plausible deniability in this particular case. Um, a lot of times you look at this and you look at something like Abu Ghraib too and the, and the people that are prosecuted are way down on the food chain. Whereas it may be people giving the orders that are responsible. After the report aired, I began receiving hundreds of hate mails and death threats, most calling me a traitor because of the way that we told this story. Everyone thought the Marines' actions were justified. And it was our failure, the media's failure, that fueled the firestorm. The Marines didn't kill me. They didn't take the videotape away from me. The government didn't tr try to stop me. We, me, NBC, we censored the video ourselves. Our bad choice was like Jack Nicholson as Colonel Jessup in the film A Few Good Men, telling the public, you can't handle the truth. We decided it was too costly to tell when in fact, it was too costly not to. By not airing the full videotape, as the other international news organizations did, we failed the American public. By the way, I was part of a pool. This video went out to everybody. Al Jazeera, BBC, ABC, all of our competitors. We shared all the footage within Fallujah so everybody would have a picture of what was happening in their sector of the battle. I don't know how that videotape was aired or explained on those other outlets, only my outlet. But I, knew, I do know that no American station ever showed the full video. But nearly almost all of the stations in Europe and in the Middle East did. So the very fighting force which was involved in this particular incident, the public that sent them there did not get a chance to view the videotape and to decide at that moment whether that was OK. And again, I'll take this a point further. Maybe that's justified. Maybe to win a war, you have to kill everybody in the room. It's up for debate. But if that's the case, I want you to decide, and you have to have the information to make that decision and to, to debate it. If it's OK to kill everybody in the room, then consider that there will be possible consequences of doing that. You will not be looked on as a benign force. You will not have people surrendering to you anymore. Uh, and you will be looked at upon as, this is the way we're going to operate. It's a ruthless force. Everybody's dead once this group comes in. You have to live with consequences of that kind of policy as a nation, which means potentially your travel is affected, potentially your quality of life is affected. But you, can, you should debate that. We shouldn't debate it for you, and we did. We took away the information that you needed to make that decision. And because of it, um, we failed you. 
by not airing that full videotape as the other international organizations did. We abdicated our role as journalists to honestly report what we see, to encourage public debate, and to hold the government accountable, and we did none of those things. With the intense criticism, NBC began to distance itself from me as well, calling me a freelance cameraman instead of a trusted correspondent with a long track record. I was isolated with few options left, but to accept what would again be surely the end of my career. But then I remembered one last option. My blog, my independent blog. If there ever was a deus ex machina moment, this was it. I had one of those rare chances for a do-over. To tell the story completely and accurately in my own words, to provide details and nuance necessary, as well as highlighting my own personal struggles and failures and failures in trying to do the right thing here. Once I posted the story, visitors to kevinsites.net swelled to more than two million. Media outlets around the world also picked it up. It seemed to mitigate some of the misconceptions about the incident, while also demonstrating the power of the web as an independent medium for news reporting. It taught me that a credible reporter with important information could rival the impact of established media by telling the story on the internet. I was now fully convinced of the power of the web, and this incident, as painful as it was, led to my next project, away from network news and onto the internet. Next to some of those buildings right along the coastline. too much, but sometimes if you do that every once in a while, it puts you on the scene and it, it ends up being a bit more intimate. I mean, you can see what's going on. Obviously, those women and children coming out of the, the house, very, very powerful images. Uh, but I think as viewers, we want to connect sometimes with people telling us the story. And so we need to know that they're there. And we need to know that they're actually there. Um, and so that was holding the camera up, just you know, trying to pan around and show what we could. Was that camera in your hand on a tripod? It's my hand. Sometimes I use a monopod. Um, you just stick it on there and I'll just hold it and move it around. There's all kinds of fun toys to do that. Um, but uh, the images that you see here, you know, this is the other side of conflict. You're know, starting to see the collateral damage, the stuff that happens, you know, the babies and the women covered with dust. And just, those are powerful images. And, and being there early and fast, I mean, I hate to, I hate to cover war in the aftermath. Um, you don't you don't get the same effect, you know, seeing it while it's actually happening, you know, can be a dangerous and difficult situation, but at the same time it, it lends both the emotional and the credibility as well as the cost of what you're seeing, you know, right in front of you.
The creation of my hot zone project was possible, I'm convinced, only because of a collision of market forces. I had an idea for trying to cover conflict with more depth and dimension, building the base of based on the accidental discovery in Fallujah with KevinSites.net. And Yahoo was interested in providing new original content as a way to stand out in this increasingly competitive field of giant internet portals like MSN and Google. My idea was to swing for the fences, to put a human face on global conflict, covering every major war in the world in one year, using a multimedia approach of text dispatches, video, still photography, all delivered on the internet. And except for my fixers, I would gather all of this alone and feed it back to producers in the US to fact check, vet, and to post on the web. This was not a blog, but online journalism. And I would do the job carrying a backpack of gear like this. That prompted one tech reporter last year to dub me uh, the granddaddy of backpack journalists. And uh, it's, a, it's a term you can probably tell that doesn't do much to impress the ladies. But I guess it's no worse than the slew of other confusing monikers for journals like me who shoot, edit, write, report, or transmit their own stories. There have been all kinds of names for us. There are a few that we could probably consider. Flojo, now nah, that's a runner. Hojo's, no, hotel chain. J-Lo, no, that's the finest Lopez. Help us, St. Anderson Cooper, what do we call ourselves? Sojo's, Mojo's, whatever. I mean, I'm sure you've heard all of these terms, solo journalist, mobile journalist. Um, I think it's as confusing as journalism itself these days. You know, where are we trying to go and how are we trying to do it? Regardless of that conundrum, for me, the hot zone was the best job I ever had while it lasted. I was given an American Express meeting card, no limits, and told to go wherever the story was. I traveled from west to east, starting in Somalia, ending 368 days, 71 airplanes, 30 countries, 20 conflict zones, 1,300 photos, 150 dispatches, and 130 video reports later. The site became popular with both the public and the critics, winning dozens of international awards and at its peak, drawing two million viewers a week. This is just a little compendium of what I saw that year.
that's the opening montage from the uh, documentary that we did that uh, actually comes with the book called World of Conflict. And, and you see a lot of faces in there that, that don't look that different from yours. I mean, there are young people that are involved in these conflicts as combatants, as casualties, as collateral damage, um, as government officials, all of them. And so, you know, the idea is, is to put that human face on it so you can identify uh, and you can see that what they're going through, um, although it seems worlds away in some some situations, um, it's not. It's about people. It's about people just like you. There was one problem with the hot zone. There's always one problem, right? You never made any money. We had one advertiser in the lifespan of the project. I don't know if you guys remember this, the George Clooney film, Syriana. You see it or remember it? That was our advertiser. While the hot zone helped to boost Yahoo's image as a content provider, if I was at the same time reporting on Yahoo's practice of sharing information with Chinese authorities that helped to jail potentially dozens of independent Chinese bloggers and journalists. So they've hired me to go around the world and report on conflict, and yet at the same time I find out in the middle of this particular journey they're supplying information to Chinese authorities that are putting away journalists. Piss me off. Uh, so I reported on it. What Yahoo didn't understand is that normally uh, there's a firewall between your journalism and the business practices of the company that you're working for. I worked for ABC News at the time. Um, I could report on the practices of Disney, hopefully without fear that they were going to fire me. When I started reporting on Yahoo's practice of jailing Chinese journalists, they were not very happy. It ended up in the book, but I mean, they, they did give me an interview about it. But by 2008, Yahoo opted not to continue with original reporting projects like mine, and the hot zone experiment ended along with my contract. In the throes of the economic downturn, Yahoo even stopped hosting the site as an archive, leaving it somewhere in the limbo of cyberspace, unfortunately. But the project lives on in the form of a book published by Harper Perennial and my documentary, World of Conflict, both interesting examples of internet-based project transcending the web back to traditional media. You know, we keep on thinking it's got to be this either-or situation. We do something for the web, it's going to live on the web forever. We do something in mainstream media, you know, that's where it's going to be. I don't think we have to choose one over the other. You know, it's like an artist's palette. You use all the colors and tools that are available to you. And this particular project, even though we thought the web was going to be the savior of journalism in some ways, Yahoo killed it. But it migrated uh, into, a, into a book and a documentary, so it still is able to be accessed. Um, thankfully, because a lot of um, organizations are using it, a lot of schools, uh, as an archive. When I was researching my book, I filed a Free Freedom of Information Act request with the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, or NCIS. Some of you may know it by the television program, I guess. They <coughs> it's responsible for the investigation into the mosque shooting. The 400-page document arrived almost six months after I made the request. The Marine Corporal, as I knew, had already not been charged, but there were other things that I did not know. Even though the mosque had been declared a crime scene investigation, it was destroyed two, late, two days later by a marine airstrike. Also, this man, Talib Salemni Dahl, as you can see here in that video, was very much alive after that mosque shooting. This was one of the insurgents that, in contrast to the others, had not been shot again. He only had one wound in a firefight the night before. As you see, he pulls back the blanket, he's in his underwear. There are no bombs. It's a superficial leg wound. I tried to talk with him after the mosque shooting. This is immediately after the corporal fires uh, into the other insurgent. And I didn't have a translator with me. This is the problem of American you know, public school education. I don't speak Arabic. I wish I had. He said to me, you know, you saw me here yesterday. You know I was here. I have something to tell you. I was so caught up in the story, in the video that I had just captured, that I made the mistake of leaving him there to show the Marine Battalion commander my video.
He was killed when I left, shot 23 times in the back. He was the only non-Marine witness to the earlier shooting other than myself. There has been no further investigation. And if I had stayed, the story might have turned out different. It will be my burden, always, but it's a burden that motivates me rather than paralyzes me, keeping me on the lookout in ways to change the balance back in favor so of the right. What happened? Ultimately, the privilege of bearing witness to the events I've seen has revealed several powerful truths, which turn my former conceptions of war upside down. You can write these down if you want. First, people are resilient. People are more than the sum of their misery. Seeing and reporting on them only as victims prevents us from understanding the full scope of their lives. There's laughter in their lives, too, even in the most horrible situations I've heard it. Second, people's resilience does not absolve us from seeking both long-term solutions as well as immediate assistance to those impacted by conflict. Yes, people are resilient. They're able to live or in some cases even overcome their hardships, but it doesn't absolve us from, solving, from, from helping to solve their problems or working with them to mitigate some of the misery. Haiti's a perfect example of that. It's an ongoing story to stay in our minds. Third, and most importantly, throughout history, we have mistakenly defined war as its smallest and most fleeting feature, combat, <coughs> while we should define it by its largest and most enduring feature, collateral damage, or the destruction of civil society. Battles may last only minutes, hours, or days, but the civil destruction of fighting endures for generations. And what I mean by that the collateral damage doesn't extend just to civilians. It extends to soldiers and Marines as well. Every time they have to pull the trigger, every time they have to see a friend get killed or wounded, that image doesn't go away. It stays with you all of your lives. It becomes psychological damage. There's collateral damage to themselves that lives on for generations. A family in the Congo sends the head of the household to fight for a militia. He gets killed, the rest of that family is susceptible to rape and murder or starvation because they don't have someone that can go out and make a living for them at that point. Um, they're at the mercy of other militias. There's an attrition that we don't see in this long-term collateral damage. Cluster bombs and landmines left um, from wars long ago, Vietnam and the DMZ, still taking lives, still taking limbs. That's collateral damage. That's generations of destruction. When we look at these things, combat is incredibly exciting. I would rather cover combat, you know, unfortunately, than a refugee camp. It's more interesting to me, but again, it doesn't tell the full story of war. It really doesn't. That, un that refugee camp may tell that story even better than the combat. Who who's going to win that battle will be known fairly shortly, whether we're there or not. But what's going to happen to those people in that region over the long term? I'm just not sure. And while I've spent much of my career neck deep in the misery of others, this work has imparted a profound sense of humility and empathy that daily remind me of my privileged possession and the profound personal truth that a life spent telling other people's stories has been the most enriching way to live my own. And that's the story of my life so far. Thank you for your time. And a few minutes for questions, and then we'll yeah. stick around. Kevin, can I start off by asking you what you're up to now? I know you told us earlier you're writing a book, and you're going back to Afghanistan, so maybe you could. Uh, it almost seems like I set this question up, but. Um, I, I won't take the bait completely. I am writing a second book. This one is about combatants' experience in war. It's called The Things They Cannot Say. And the idea is about how combatants' experience in wars end up defining them in so many ways, but also isolating them when they come back, uh, that they can't share it with other people. Um, 
that have not been there. And so in, in a sense, they become isolated, potentially more, uh, more subject to post-traumatic stress. And um, in doing so, by holding those stories inside them, they don't share them with a the larger community. And then we, as a society, don't understand the true cost of war because we've never heard the real stories. We hear the hero myth or we hear the atrocity, but we don't hear about the mundane, the days uh, after days where nothing happens, or the days where small things happen. Um, and those are stories that we need to hear as well if we're going to be an educated society that can, number one, send our young men and women off to war with a clear conscience, knowing what they're up against, and number two, welcoming them back into society when they come back here, and not giving them a patronizing thank you for your service, and then glaze over as they begin to tell us a story. We need to be there with them and listen to them and hear those those whole stories and make them know it's okay for them to tell them to us because they, they don't want to tell them to us because they don't feel that we understand and usually our our language and our body actions our our body uh, language and our, our actions rather give them that impression uh, I was going to show you a video clip of, of a soldier that I shot right after the mosque shooting I videotaped after the mosque shooting it's a really powerful um, it's a really powerful monologue. I asked him a couple of questions, uh, and he had, the, the insurgents that you saw in that mosque, he was responsible for killing six of them. What happened, he walked in there, opened up a closet door, there were nine of them in there, all armed, uh, but they didn't fire. But, you know, it was that standoff for a second, and then he raised his rifle, he shot six, another Marine shot three. And so it was the shock of having just taken out six guys and then seeing their bodies spread out all over the mosque floor, um, and then uh, and then just realizing what had just happened, him processing it, and I talked to him right after that, um, and it was a really really powerful dialogue, and I want to show it to you, uh, but it's a couple of minutes long. I'll take a few more questions, and then if you want, I'll show it to you afterwards. And, this, this is what you, and you're going back to Afghanistan. Right? I am going back to Afghanistan. Can you talk about that a little bit, maybe. Um, yeah, and I mean the thing is, I I don't. I don't want to make it seem like you always have to be in an interesting or exciting place to do this job, because you don't. You know, there's stories all around you. Uh, I've decided to focus on conflict because it fascinates me on, on one level, uh, but there's a huge price to pay for it. Um, you live with it always. You take the images that you have and you carry them with you. But I don't want us, like I said, to be seduced by the images of conflict. It, it's too easy to look at this stuff and say, that's the coolest thing ever. You know, I, I want to see that AT4 fired again. I mean, as guys, we love to see things explode. And every time I shot footage like that, I would get on the air with M M NBC, not MSNBC, with Brian Williams or Tom Brokaw. Every time I was in a refugee camp, I was on MSNBC on the cable network. So we are drawn to that in some ways, uh, but we can't let it seduce us. We have to figure out as journalists, how many of you are journalists here, by the way, or study to be? Okay. I mean, we got a challenging job ahead of us. I mean, we're we're partly responsible for the misperception of war, not just American journalists, journalists around the war, around the world. Um, but uh, we've got to figure out a way to cover the full story, which is the collateral damage as well. And we just we haven't done it very well yet. We haven't found a way to make it as interesting as this, you know, as the conflict. Yes. I want to thank you, first of all, for uh, a very powerful presentation full of ethical issues. I'm interested in last time. We'll talk about it, I'm sure. But my question now is really very mundane. How do you stay calm in the midst of conflict? How do you manage to film yourself and not have your hand took out of the trouble? That's a good question. Um, the, I don't know if you all heard it. Uh, the question was, how do you manage to stay calm in the middle of you know filming combat? Uh, I think it's it's a matter of degrees. You know, the first war I went to was um, probably before you guys were born, uh, 1986, Nicaragua. I went down as you know one of those danger dilettantes that goes down and gets captured, um, you know because they want to be in the middle of it. They, they don't speak Spanish and they shouldn't be there at the beginning because they don't know what they're doing. That was me. Um, and I went down there and I, I started covering this this conflict. Um, and I sort I saw my first dead bodies, so you see that. And then I, um, there were a couple of other conflicts in between. And I went to Kosovo and I started to hear what artillery sounded like and small arms fire and things like that. And so you, you kind of get conditioned to it. After a while, don't you get conditioned to it? Well, I mean, I, I was in the infantry and I've never seen a dead body, but when I was in Iraq, it was 
it was a lot different. I was in there 2007 to 2008, so the war by that time was just, you know, small, sporadic. Once bombs, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but you start to learn, some of what takes your fear away is you start to learn what's mo <coughs> most lethal to you, and you recognize outgoing artillery as opposed to incoming. Um, you also realize that people shooting with you, shooting at you with rifles, um, a lot of times are not that accurate. They're doing the Iraqi overhand or the Afghan overhand. They're shooting it like this, not aiming. Um, they're just spraying. So you're not so afraid of that. Um, you get very afraid of artillery and mortars and stuff. And this stuff gets zeroed in, uh, and just even the sound of it, the whistling, kind of scares the shit out of you. Um, yet if you hear it whistling, you're okay because it's passing over. If it's not whistling, then it's going to drop on you like this one did. So you, you get you get conditioned to it, and then all of a sudden you're like, okay, now I can be in the middle of the street knowing what's going on a little bit. Um, and then, did, you, did any of you ever see the movie Crash? Do you remember there was that scene where um, the little girl jumps into some guy's arms at the end and he shoots, he shoots the handgun, it's a blank, but she was his magic shield for a second. The camera in some ways feels like a magic shield. You're behind this and you're looking at it and you feel like nothing can happen to you because you're you're shooting a POV. You're, you're not even there in some ways, so the camera gives you that distance, or it does for me. Um, when, you're, when you're covering a conflict and like enemy combatants see you, see that you're a journalist, do they not shoot at you, or I mean? Yeah, they raise their rifles and shoot up in the air. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Hey, no, I, I don't think they, uh, it's a good question because they don't know the difference between, I'm with American forces, I'm embedded, uh, I try not to dress like Marines. I had long hair, you know, for that specific reason, um, because I, I would deal with a lot of Afghanis or Iraqi civilians, and I didn't want to come in with a helmet and a flak jacket. You know, I want to talk to them um, outside of my embed. And when you're embedded, you can only cover the troops. You know, that's your story. And so I, I might as well get shot at because I'm with them and I'm asking them to protect me from them. So, I, you know, basically, it, it's like you took a side. Um, one of the rules of embedding with American forces right now is that, um, well, there, there are a number of rules. You have to basically stipulate that you're not going to give away their positions or their numbers and so on. But one of the things that bothers me the most is that they feel that they have to protect you in the field. I don't want to be protected by them because if, if a Marine or a soldier gets killed you know, trying to save my ass, um, then he's not doing his job. I, I want to ride in the Humvee. And I want an MRE, you know, I want food, I want all those things because I'm a taxpayer and I probably deserve that. I don't deserve him, you know, shooting to protect me. I'm, I'm gonna run around and do my job. And then I think I should there should be a waiver that says Marines and soldiers are not there to protect you. I mean this is kind of controversial, but I don't want that protection. You know, I don't want to be left behind, but at the same time I would feel better that I'm doing my job in a more objective way. But if you have to rely on someone to save your life. Um, tendency to, you know, want to report favorably. I mean, you do develop relationships with these people. You're just going to, you know, I let them use my my sat phone, call their girlfriends, call their wives, and you shoot the shit with them. There's a lot of stuff that goes on um, that makes you close to them. At the same time, it will be the same as covering a government official. If somebody does something wrong. Hey, I had drinks with you the other night, but you know, you shouldn't have been embezzling all this money from from the state funds. Yeah. Um, in one of the in the video where you guys were like pinned down. The guy was like shooting the rifle and then you ran across the street. Are they like, when you're when the battle happened, are they like talking to you, telling you where to be, or do you just? I do what I want. You just like yeah. buzz around while people are shooting at you? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean, it's probably not the smartest thing to do, but I know what angles I want. And, you know, you, you can be with a unit that will be very protective. You don't want to be with that kind of unit. You know, someone wants to throw you down on the ground, you know, when there's firing on. No, this is my job. and. and I've probably been in more combat situations than most of these kids. I mean, they're half my age, you know, and I've been doing this for 10 years. So I kind of do know what's going on there, and, and I, I want to make sure that I get the best shot. Um, I've taken stupid chances before, but, um, you know, again, I've, I've come out, fortunately, without a scratch. I don't know why. Yes? I'd say maybe one more, because then we got to uh, get with refreshments going and signs. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to like make sure. Yeah, you want to stay could, on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just feel like anybody yeah, who has to go to class or whatever, you feel free to.
and if we don't get into all of these, I mean, I, I'll sort of talk it out in front of the music But I, I'm happy to take a few more. Yes. Um, when you, you, know, you, had, uh, when you saw that soldier, Um, the question was, when the Marine shot the insurgent, was it hard for me to not give my opinion? Um, you know when you see something that is not right, and you feel it in your gut? I I've seen people get killed in before, but I've never seen an execution. I felt it in my gut that minute, and I also knew that from then on, three lives have just changed forever. An insurgent that just got killed, the Marine had pulled the trigger on my own. Um, we witnessed those things. I didn't know what was in his mind, and I didn't know what the rules of engagement were, so I gave him latitude. You know, was he ordered to do that? Um, was he scared? Was he afraid that this guy really was booby-trapped? His actions told me otherwise, you know, that he, he spun on his heels and walked out. There's a certain amount of bravado with that, but there's also, um, there's a feeling that, hey, I just watched one of my friends get killed, you know? This guy is not going to do that. I'm going to make sure he's not around to booby-trap him. And that, that is a legitimate thought process. But there are all, also other things that are lost in that process. If you don't take these guys as um, captive, you potentially may have lost a good intelligence source. The other thing is that that Marine and any soldier that commits what would be considered a war crime or atrocity has to live with that for the rest of their lives. Their commanders, for the most part, if they're good commanders, want to prevent that from happening, not just because it reflects on them and, and their orders and their, their leadership, but they know that that soldier or Marine is going to be debilitated for the rest of their lives. This kid, I never named him. I didn't want to name him. Um, but he went to Vegas, you know, quickly uh, cut his hair into a mohawk, started riding Harleys, you know, got lost in, in Sin City. Uh, he still has a hard time with this. He never wanted to see the video. Never wanted to watch the video. He said it was too bloody. Too bloody to watch the video that you know, he, he saw sighting down the end of his M16. So, I mean, you know, war does things to you. I, I don't, he's a victim too. Um, it, it's hard because people will pressure you as a journalist. I became the story in this particular situation and they want to pressure you to become a definitive expert on something. I don't know what's in people's heads all the time. I can only tell you what I've observed, give you the facts in the background, and then, you know, using the base of my knowledge, knowing you know what a tactical situation is, I can say that wasn't tactical. Um, and on face value, it does violate the Geneva Convention. So who's responsible for it? That Marine or the person that gave him the order to do it? You know, the order, the rules of engagement beforehand. Yes. Um, knowing that you were gonna put that video out there for like the country, did you talk to that soldier like? Or at least story on. Oh, I tried to talk to him right afterwards. I said, and what are you what are you doing? And he, uh, and he says, um, I said, these were the guys that were here yesterday. You know, they were shot yesterday. Said, I didn't know, sir, I didn't know. And maybe he didn't. And at the same time, check him. Check him, you know. Yeah. And uh, this has happened before, you know. So yeah, I mean, you know, we want to believe it's it's all really well organized. It's not. Um, Bear with me, let me show you this video clip. It's the most powerful piece of video that you're gonna have seen today. It, it's a little bit disturbing, but the strange thing about it, you're not gonna see anybody get, well, you will see some dead bodies in the beginning, but. This is what I'm talking about for my next book, um, The Things They Can't Say. This is a particular Marine that I interviewed immediately after he had shot these guys in the mosque. Uh, once I do this, then we can, we'll do we'll refreshments and other yes. But I, I want you to see this, and I'll answer any other questions in person if you want. Well, yes, those are the ones that are back there. They are, there's one dead, and uh, I'm gonna show you why I'm do This is the Marine. Look at his face while he's, he's looking over what's happening. He's like shaking his head, he just he doesn't even realize what's, what's happening. The battalion commander takes a picture. Why are you getting out? What's that? Why are you getting out? I just want to be normal. I want to live a normal life. Do you think you can end for this? I'm sure I'll be alright. 
I've changed a lot since I joined the Marine Corps, though. Especially being over here. You just, I'll never take anything for granted, ever again. Does it harden you? Uh, my last command hardened me pretty much. This place will, it'll make you pretty hard. It'll give you some thick skin. I'm tired of that, too. Too much big booms. What will you do after this? I got a scholarship to play football. WSU. Go Cougs! What position? I'm a linebacker. I have a full ride scholarship out of high school, but I joined the Marine Corps instead. How'd you do that? Um, my pops always told me it's my duty to serve my country as a young American. So, he was killed when I was 12, so I figured I'd, I'd do what he told me to do. Was he a Marine too? No, he was in the Army. How was he killed? He was murdered when I was 12. How did that happen? I don't know, they never found a guy that did it. So you did it in his memory? What's that? You joined in his memory? I just joined to help Americans. I love my family. My fiance. I never want her to ever have to worry about anybody coming into our country. I'd rather kill them in their backyard than have them come to our backyard. The more I kill here, the less I gotta worry about coming into my country. Scare you at all? Uh, like to break into a house like that? The guys have guns pointed at you. I don't have time to think about that shit. When I first got it, I was I was always worried about. My friend told me today, man, you were so worried about getting killed when you first got it. But now I don't have time to think about that shit. You bust into a house. Just like today, I had people point AKs at me and say, "I got people in less than ten seconds." First thing I do, ten seconds. Shit goes right out the window. I don't He survived his combat tours, um, but he had a traumatic brain injury from a concussion from a roadside bomb in a Humvee. Um, came back to Pendleton in California. Uh, got hooked on painkillers, and, uh, and the painkillers weren't enough along with the post-traumatic stress that he was suffering from. So he started uh, complementing the painkillers that he was taking with street methadone. He buy methadone off the street. Methadone is what heroin addicts sometimes are, are given as a way to kind of swap out of their addiction. And uh, methadone will treat that in some ways without the same kind of addiction qualities that heroin has. Uh, but he was using that. And he would sometimes forget uh, how much medication he had taken. He'd double his medication. He had planned a camping trip with friends the next day, had gone out to a burger joint, got a couple of tattoos, so obviously he, I don't think he was thinking about suicide, but he took his medication that night along with the methadone and then uh, died in his sleep at some point. So, but I mean, this is not you know, an uncommon story. I mean, these are the stories that we see and they're very much alive right there. Um, and there's kind of a cognitive dissonance when you understand that now he's no longer around, 23 years old responsible for having killed six people and there has to live with that, has to live with traumatic brain injury, has to live with an addiction to hard drugs um, for the pain that he suffered, collateral damage, that's what I'm talking about. You know, it's not just civilians, it's soldiers as well. So um, that's all I have. I want to share that with you. Um, I'll I'll talk to you more. Uh, I, I guess we do the books yeah, on the outside. Yeah, we have both the and, and the books are outside. If you want to know more, I, I'm more I hope that I got through some points tonight, but the book certainly provides a little bit more detail and, uh, and the documentary is worth some.